Uh, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Just wait for everyone to um, take their seats. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Tom Gibson. I'm the EU representative for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Welcome to the launch of uh, the annual report of the Council of Europe Journalist Safety Platform. Uh, this year's report is called uh, Press Freedom in Europe, Time to Turn the Tide. And um, for those who aren't familiar with the annual report, uh, what we do is we assess the major issues undermining press freedom. Uh, these include threats and intimidation, detention, restrictive legislation, abusive lawsuits, media capture, um, and attacks on public service media, amongst others. And we also have recommendations, which we'll talk you through um, during this session. Um, we hope that this report is a useful reference now for press freedom. It, it captures a lot of what is happening around Europe. Um, uh, but we're always, as a platform, as, as 15 organizations, we're always trying to use both the report and, and uh, the alerts that we post on the platform where we request that member states respond um, and respond with action. Uh, we, we hope that we're, we're actually generating political will to, to do more. Um, with the ongoing war in, in, in Ukraine, uh, the soaring number of journalists killed in Gaza and the threat of populism and disinformation, um, it really does feel as if we're in a, a critical time. Um, also because we have so many elections around the world um, and at this critical juncture it is more important than ever to defend the space for media freedom. Uh, I would like to, just before I get started and talk about how today's uh, session is going to work, i uh, like to say a few thanks. Uh, firstly, to the Journey Journalists Union of Macedonia and Thrace um, for, for their um, uh, hosting, um, joint hosting of, of today's event. Uh, also, Jean-Paul Marteau's Belgian journalist and press freedom activist, who's been in charge of the editorial coordination of this report, which is quite the achievement given the number of issues and the array of information that we have to pull together. Uh, and also uh, a big thank you to Cartoonists for Peace for the illustrations which are included in the report. So um, how is this press conference going to work? We're going to have uh, two panels. The first uh, will look at some of the issues that we really feel as platform partners are important to highlight this year. Um, this is because of our work and our ongoing concerns around their impact on the way that journalists can work. Uh, so the first panel is going to look at questions of surveillance, the protection of sources, and media capture. And the second will look at uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation, which, as many of you will know, are vexatious lawsuits brought by the rich and powerful um, against journalists to try to silence them. So uh, on top of uh, these lawsuits, we're going to have a look at the question of journalists in exile, because that's really a very important issue now. Uh, journalists working uh, outside of their country and trying to continue their jobs. And we're going to finish off with looking at the Journalist uh, Matter uh, campaign, which has been uh, started by the Council of Europe. We have nine speakers, which is a lot. Um, and the representatives from the platform partners are going to talk about the report's findings. But we are a platform for journalists, and that's essentially what we want to do. We want to be able to also, with this session, raise the voices of journalists themselves. We want to hear from them about their situations and about the challenges that they've had to get around, about the problems that they've had. Um, for participants online, you, you have a, a Q&A chat function, so please, I'll be watching that. Um, what we'll do is we'll have the presentations from the first panel, um, and then after that, we'll look at, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be able to field some of your questions and comments. Um, so without further ado, because I want to keep my own presentation quite short, uh, I, it's my pleasure to, uh, to, to welcome our first speaker, uh, Ricardo Guiterez from the European Federation of Journalists, who's going to provide a quick overview of, of surveillance and uh, the problems that that um, pose for journalists. Thank you, Tom. Um, yes, uh, surveillance and, and 
intimidation of journalistic sources uh, is really becoming a, a major uh, issue for journalists, and not only for journalists, it's a major issue, uh, it's a threat to democracy. So we are here to discuss the 2023 20, uh, report um, of the Council of Europe platform, and this report highlighted new cases of uh, unlawful surveillance of journalists in Armenia and Azerbaijan, in Germany and Latvia, in Greece, uh, with the Predator Gate uh, scandal in Hungary. Um, there are now hundreds uh, of documented uh, cases in Europe, uh, and virtually no prosecutions uh, against those who have deployed uh, spyware against journalists. In, in our view, uh, there is a deliberate impunity aimed at intimidating the sources of investigative journalists, those who best serve the public interest, those who are the watchdogs uh, of the rule of law. After my introduction, you will hear uh, the testimonies of journalists. Uh, some of them no longer have confidence in, in the authorities of their own countries or even in international bodies. And I fully understand them. Uh, why? Because the response of governments to these threats to democracy, uh, the response is weak, to say the least. You may remember that in December, some European Union member states, I will mention them, France, Italy, Greece, Malta, Cyprus, Sweden, and Finland, these countries tried to legalize uh, spying on journalists uh, on the vague grounds of national security. These seven countries wanted to insert uh, these provisions uh, into the European Media Freedom Act, which is the first European regulation supposed to defend press freedom. And colleagues from RSF, uh, they are in the room, uh, revealed French government documents that show that France wanted to legalize the practice because it is already doing so illegally. Yeah. I really invite you to observe the cynicism. Governments using a European law that is supposed to protect the press to legalize the spying of journalists. My personal feeling, this is not in the report, my personal feeling is that governments remain passive because this threat to journalists suits them. Without confidentiality of sources, there is no longer any journalism serving the public, only communication serving those in power. Our report strongly denounces the deliberate inertia of governments. That is our first priority recommendation on, pi on page five uh, of, of the report, I read it, Council of Europe member states should impose without delay a moratorium on the export, sale, transfer, and use of highly intrusive spyware tools such as Pegasus and establish clearer, stronger regulatory frameworks for the use of modern surveillance technology. In addition, the partners of the Council of Europe platforms call on governments to stop deploying spyware against journalists in violation of uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. We call on the courts to investigate any use of spyware against journalists, to identify the masterminds and to convict them. This has not yet happened. Hundreds of cases, not a single conviction. And finally, we call on states to strengthen the legislation protecting journalist sources. It is not enough to implement the European Media Freedom Act. We need to go further. Belgian legislation, which is more protective than the EMFA, the European Media Freedom Act, is an example to follow. It is possible if there is the political will. Thank you for your, your attention, and I think we'll give the Thank floor. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. The next, well, I mean, the next case is, is one that really, I think, got recognition in terms of uh, what we're now seeing is, as um, a detrimental impact to the way that journalists are, are able to work. Um, Sabot uh, 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 Pani, a Hungarian investigative journalist, 
Um, uh, and it really uh, is, is indicative, um, the, the surveillance that he's been, been under is indicative of, of, of some of the problems that we're seeing. Uh, Sabo, uh, are you um, able to talk us through what happened and now where things stand in terms of uh, where to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me to this uh, panel, and I'm sorry I can't be there uh, in person. Um, I think my intervention won't be an optimistic one, so sorry for that uh, in advance. Uh, I work as an investigative journalist in Hungary for, for more than 10 years now, uh, and I guess I got some more recognition in recent years when, when it was revealed that I was among those journalists in Hungary who was surveilled with the uh, controversial Pegasus uh, uh, spyware. I was also among the, the, the journalistic team uh, who was investigating uh, cases of surveillance uh, back in 2021. Um, and what we revealed is that there was a mass and systematic abuse of the Hungarian intelligence services surveillance capabilities, not only journalists, but also sources of journalists, experts commenting and giving uh, um, tips and hints to journalists were surveilled uh, and of course also media company owners. Um, so this all pointed to the fact that uh, there's uh, uh, essentially uh, a political surveillance machine working uh, in Hungary because it was very obvious from the first cases when we first saw the data, the phone numbers uh, of targets of the Pegasus spyware that uh, there's only one actor. Uh, that is interested in surveilling all these people, and that is the government of Hungarian Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban. Uh, briefly on my individual case, um, my phone was hacked with the Pegasus spyware back in 2019 for a seven months period while I was working on multiple uh, sensitive investigative stories. Uh, these mostly concerned Russian influence in Hungary. Uh, and the, the rest of the Hungarian journalists who got also surveilled we're also either working on Russian influence in Hungary or corruption related stories, EU fraud related stories, uh, or they were media company owners uh, who were financing and running independent journalism in the country that was critical of uh, Viktor Orban's government. So after we discovered uh, all this in 2021, and there was a scandal for a couple of months, it seemed that uh, things could change. Uh, not so much in Hungary, but at least on a European Union or a global level. Uh, but so far, I don't really see many encouraging signs. Of course, the European Media Freedom Act is uh, is one of them, but the implementation of that is uh, going to be the tricky part, especially when it comes to Hungary. So just briefly uh, going through what happened uh, from the Hungarian authorities side after the discovery that the Hungarian state is abusing its surveillance capabilities. Well, first, the Hungarian government for months didn't even acknowledge that they were using the Pegasus spyware against us. Uh, then there was a slip of the tongue, uh, a Hungarian uh, senior member of parliament inadvertently um, uh, told that, yeah, yeah, we do have this uh, uh, software, but it's just a spyware and we have done, you know, other ones as well. Uh, and from that point on, the Hungarian government has been claiming that each and every surveillance in the country is legal, including the surveillance of journalists. There was an investigation by the Hungarian prosecutor's office. There was also an investigation by the so-called um, National uh, Media and uh, Information Freedom Authority. Uh, they all found that there was no wrongdoing from the government side, that uh, they did confirm that the surveillances took place, but they also claimed that each and every surveillance in line with what the government claims was legitimate. At the same time, uh, myself was also investigated by the same data protection authority uh, because uh, they were curious how I got the phone number. This was, you know, a big leak, the base of the Pegasus uh, project back in 2019, how I, how I got the leaked phone number of an uh, intelligence officer who was actually operating the spyware, and I called up this guy. Uh, then this guy reported uh, me to the authority. So in the end of the day, it was me who got uh, investigated for that. But hopefully, uh, you know, nothing will come out of that. So far, it seems that the case is closed and uh, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, and uh, also what's uh, what's more concerning is that there's, uh, as it was said in the previous uh, presentation, 
there's absolute impunity in Hungary. Um, none of those politicians who were involved in approving and permitting these surveillances paid any kind of uh, a political cost. Uh, the scandal just um, um, evaporated, uh, the news cycle moved on. And uh, the problem is that currently the whole surveillance thing in Hungary seems to be normalized. Everyone takes it for granted that, sur that the journalists or the opposition are surveilled. It's like the new norm. And we don't really see any kind of serious push from the European Union to, uh, to end that uh, attitude. Thank you. Thanks, Sabo. And uh, one thing that obviously came from the European Parliament PEGA uh, committee report, which looked into the use of Pegasus and other spyware, is just the complete sort of institutional failures to properly investigate. And, and really, they, they just, despite the very uh, intricate recommendation, said that there hasn't been enough political action and we, we need more pressure. Um, but I mean, now leaving Hungary, I mean, this this question of uh, protection of sources and the ability to work as a journalist is now it's uh, under threat uh, throughout the EU. And uh, if we go to France, we, we have uh, Ariane uh, Laville from uh, Disclose. You can um, uh, you can talk us through um, what happened in September last year and um, yeah. <laughs> the impact now on you and your work and also the, the climate in France, because as we've highlighted in the platform, um, you know, they're, they're, they're real problems for journalists, right? Yes, uh, underreported, but a, a, a big problem. Uh, so my name is Ariane Lavrieux. Uh, I'm an investigative uh, journalist uh, from France. And last uh, September, my flat was raided. A uh, French intelligence officer used Israeli and homemade technology to hack my phone, extract and analyze all data that was stored in my computer and devices. I've been detained for 39 hours, interrogated and kept in an underground cold cell in Marseille, deprived for several hours of medication and access to toilet despite being sick. So what crime was I suspected, uh, suspected of committing? Um, doing my job, just doing my job. As a reporter based in Egypt, uh, I participated in an investigation published by Disclose three years ago. This non-profit media revealed in 2021 that France has been helping Egypt to kill civilians uh, for at least five years in the desert by giving intelligence to Egyptian army in order to please one of the main buyer of French weaponry. I met victims and witnesses in the desert. Our investigation made angry both France and Egypt authorities because they wanted to keep it secret. And a month ago, uh, two NGO filed a complaint at the European Court of hum Human Rights against France. So you may will hear about this story uh, in the upcoming month. The French judge didn't ask me how many victims were killed thanks to French intelligence. She just wanted to know the sources of this clause. Who are all these brave citizens who have been uh, leaking secret defense uh, document to this clause since it was created six years ago? That is what French justice is after. They interrogated before other colleagues of, uh, of this clause uh, for on other uh, investigation. So you might think that my case is shocking. You might have seen some uh, headlines, uh, many uh, uh, international uh, or, uh, journalist organization um, made statements, but you may think it's unique. You are wrong. Uh, a year ago, journalist Alex Jordanov was detained, indicted and for divulging a secret of national defense. A photojournalist was spied on, detained, indicted by anti-terrorism anti police for following radical climate activists. A month ago, three investigative journalists were summoned by judge because they revealed preferential treatment of military uh, subcontractors. Within the last seven years, 17 journalists have been targeted by intelligence in order to track down, scare, and dry up their sources in France. And to do so, France is using all legal tools uh, at her disposal. France is even using the Council of Europe and our most precious safeguard, which is the European Convention of Human Rights. How come? Uh, well, France has been diverted a decision of the European Court of Human Rights in order to protect 
state secrets and lies from public scrutiny. I mean, I'm talking here about the decision, old decision, of uh, that's called Godwin versus UK. It was in 1996. I will read it and pay attention because this is really critical. Having regard to the importance of the protection of journalistic sources for press freedom in a democratic society and the potentially chilling effect that an order of source disclosure has on the exercise of press freedom, such a measure cannot be compatible with Article 10, you know it, that protects freedom of expression, unless it is justified by an overriding requirement in public interest. Voilà. In just a few words, you can delete, delete press freedom if it, if it is justified by an overriding requirement in the public interest. These six words have been opening a major breach that we are still paying the consequences now. Because this overriding requirement was never defined, but copy-paste in French law in 2010. And since then, a judge can decide alone to detain, seize journalist property, spy on us in order to disclose our sources that we keep secret precisely because we want to protect them from such attack. That's what happened to me, to Alex, to Johan, and will happen to many, many, many others if somebody do not remind France what freedom of expression and freedom to receive information means. We, uh, that's in the, in, the, in the convention. And did I tell you also that in France, you can type legally a journalist without even a judge approval. You, can just, you just have to have an administrative approval that has refused only 1.5% of intelligence requests in the last five years, in the last years. So we have been really under a silent attack for years. So that's why uh, a group of journalists and citizens and syndicates uh, have just created a new observatory that will monitor all attacks against, against uh, press freedom in France. It will create the first publicly available uh, database. Uh, the, the name is OFALP. In, in French, Observatoire uh, des Atteintes à la Liberté uh, de, de la Presse. Uh, and I will just conclude, because sometimes I hear, oh, come on, uh, in France it's not that bad, you know, journalists in, in, in Russia are in, uh, in a dire state, in, in, in even in Egypt, uh, we are not yet in, in a dictatorship. Okay, so you want to help journalists under dictatorship, so listen to Allah Abdel Fattah who is prominent Egyptian re revolutionary thinker of the revolution and now in, in, in prison. He said, he wrote, a setback for human rights in a place where democracy has deep roots is certain to be used as an excuse for even worse violation in society where rights are more fragile. So if you want to help, start by fixing your own democracy now. I will add. Thank you. And um, I think that there's real debate at the moment that's happening around things, questions like national security, legitimate interests, and those definitions, which actually, for so many member states in different contexts, allow for a, a lot of wiggle room. Um, and again, what we need is clarity around those judicial safeguards that could be put in place. Um, but one of the attempts from the EU to do that is the European Media Freedom Act. And when we're looking at the investigative journalists, who are carrying out sensitive work, it's also often in a context of, of media capture. And I think it's really important. We're going to hand over to uh, Oliver Money Curl now from the International Press Institute. But when we're looking at these, these, this uncertainty and the pressure that journalists are under, it's also in the context of um, uh, an unequal economic playing field often. Um, and, and that as well, that's... That's a real issue that we wanted to highlight, right, Oliver, as a platform. Um, is this on? Yes, this well, well, you're right, it, it is a real issue. It's a much duller issue than the ones you've just been talking about. And I think it is quite hard to follow these two very personal testimonies um, about how, you know, the time you've spent in jail and, or, 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 and, and, and Zabo's talk about, about being targeted in Hungary. It's very hard to follow those personal testimonies with the talk about 
economic um, imbalances um, used to sort of squeeze out ind independent media. Just to come back to the European Media Freedom Act, because because Ricardo sort of made reference to it in, in his opening. One of the questions is to what degree would Article 4 of that help to address some of these issues? And I think at least, you know, for, for the weaknesses of the Media Freedom Act, and I will come back to that in terms of the media capture, there are some principles that are set in there that can help, one of which is that any use of spy where would, would require a judicial approval. It's not, it's not just a judge, but there are a judicial institution. So this idea that a, an individual in the government can just order it without getting some sort of judicial approval, at least that would, that would end, one would hope. And I think there was a similar, similarly in Hungary, I think, there's that uh, Java was referring to where I think ministers were able to uh, uh, order spyware themselves without, without going to, to any court. So I think there is some, hopefully the, the Media Freedom Act will help inter in, in, intervene in some areas. Look, as I said, I mean, it's, it, media capture is not dull. I mean, let's be clear about that. But it does go under the radar. One of the problems with it is that we don't have these individual cases. One of the problems is we don't have individual cases of journalists being jailed or newsrooms being raided because the way it's designed is it's a sort of form of assertion of control by stealth, by the use of um, uh, arm's length legal, me uh, legal means to create an economic or regulatory barriers to independent media, or at the same time fueling uh, pro-government media with state advertising or, or rewarding the owners of those media with often highly lucrative uh, state contracts in, in, in other industries. I'll give a couple of examples later. Um, very briefly, media capture by government, because there are different types of media capture, but we try to focus mostly on, 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 on government-led uh, or state-led uh, media capture. It's the misuse of state powers to assert control over the media and the four uh, four key pillars. It's actually very straightforward. There's the political takeover of public service media. It's the political takeover of media regulators. Um, it's the acquisition of mainstream private media by allies of the government. <clears throat> and of course, it's the discriminatory use of state resources, most obviously advertising uh, funds, but also others to create a pliant and dependent media sector. Um, it's a common tool for populist and author authoritarian governments to control public information which doesn't involve raiding, raiding newsrooms and, 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 and jailing journalists. And so it's often hard. You don't, it doesn't get picked up in the Council of Europe monitoring uh, very often. But thankfully, we are able to, we use the opportunity to, 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 to address this issue. Um, obviously, media capture wasn't invented in, in well, it, I'd say it was invented in Europe. It was invented in Russia. It was quickly exported to places like Azerbaijan or, or, or Turkey. And in the past 10 to 15 years, it has become an increasingly urgent issue within the European Union itself. Um, I think it's well known that Hungary um, has provided the European blueprint for media capture, where Fidesz, the government of power, um, not only has full control of the public service media and the regulators, but it also floods the advertising market with state funds. There was a report from, I think, the Mertec Institute that found that some 365 million euros of state funds were used for advertising in 2020 uh, 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 alone. And, and 80 or 90 percent of that was split between the public service media and between this foundation called Kesma, which was set up in 2018, which was essentially a place where all of Fidesz friendly media only oligarchs were invited to donate their media to the, founda to the foundation so that the control of that private media propaganda could be, be more efficiently um, uh, organized and, 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 and managed. Um, uh, and and uh, so, so, so the advertising is absolutely key to fueling pro government. Uh, pro-government pro propaganda, but also is this sort of use of, of um, other ways of rewarding uh, your political allies. So, for example, Laurent Mezaros, who is probably the key media player for Fidesz, is estimated to have earned 1.7 billion euros, I'll just repeat that, 1.7 billion euros in state procurement contracts. This is between, that's not overall, that's between 2018 and 2000 and 23 years, mostly um, in the construction industry. Um, interestingly enough, 80% of which um, come from EU funds. Um, so, so thank you, thank you, Brussels. 
um, for funding uh, for funding much of media capture, and that is that is a feature we see across different countries about how EU funds particularly are targeted to sort of fund um, this sort of corruption of the sort of democratic institutions. Um, so Poland, of course, it, this year has been been a, a highlight and a, and a focus of attention because until last October it was also rapidly uh, going down the Hungarian path. Unlike Hungary, it was hampered by a much larger and more diverse uh, market with a strong independent media sector and some quite still sub quite substantial foreign investment, which made it a, a, much harder for the party of law and justice, peace, uh, to gain the same level of, 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 of dominance in the media sector. And of course, it had full control of the public service media and of the media regulators, which, you know, produce its propaganda and the media regulators that, that was that was that happily find independent media and threatened them with with closure um, it also spread state advertising to its allies and with um, um, but without the same circle of oligarchs that Fidesz enjoyed peace was forced to go to the state oil company I think this is in, in a move very reminiscent of, 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 of Putin's uh, the, the early days of Putin in Russia when he used the state oil company to also purchase, I think it was NTV was the big, end of this back in 2000, 2001. So Poland mimicked that in order to purchase um, not just the Prince distribution system, but also um, the, the, the largest regional newspaper company in, in, in the country. Um, so of course, all of which poses a massive challenge for the new, the new government of the civic platform led by Donald uh, Tusk. Um, of how to unwind, uh, well, po political capture, capture of the of the media, of the public service media and the regulators, but of course it's political capture of the other institutions, most obviously um, the courts. And um, as we saw at the end of last year, at the beginning of this year, the government was forced to take extreme, thank you, I've, I've noted that, Tom, was forced to take um, extreme and inventive measures to wrestle control of the public broadcaster from peace propagandists. Um, uh, and in doing so, have been accused by some of, bend, of bending or perhaps even breaking uh, the rule of law. Um, the, the, the government, on, on its part, argues that, that, that peace is original take of the public broadca broadcast was itself a breach of the rule of law, and that this is the only way. These inventive means are the only way to correct that correct that wrong. Now, whatever your your view about that is essential, and I think that's outlined very clearly in this report, is that whatever emerges the responsibility on, on the new government is to ensure that the new public broadcaster is utterly free of political interference and is seen to be so as well. What we know is that Poland will be closely watched over the coming years. There are some other good news in the Czech Republic. They, 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 they passed um, a, uh, a, a new conflict of interest legislation which forced the former Prime Minister Andrei Babish to sell his Mafra media which had helped propel him to power um, some eight or ten years ago. But there's also bad news, because at the same time we saw the, the, the return of Robert Fico and the, the Smear government uh, to Slovakia, where um, they, bore, they are threatening to dismantle public serv the public broadcaster and to fine the independent, um, uh, not to fine independent media, but to, they've been threatening to withdraw state advertising from some independent media. And we can expect similar things to, to happen there. So that's another one to watch. Look, there are other examples um, in, in Serbia or in Italy <coughs> where we've seen the Bologna government also impose, um, place their people in control of the public service media. Um, uh, so these are sort of, there's good news and there's bad news, but it's something that we need to study very carefully. So what has to be done? Well, next week the European Parliament will hopefully sign off or vote through the European Media Freedom Act into European law. Um, the EMFA is crucial for Europe to address the threats of media capture. And it introduces measures that look at both uh, ownership transparency and the protection of media pluralism this is absolutely fundamental. There are measures to protect editorial independence in newsrooms, not just from political interference, but from, vet, from, from other forms of external or, or vested uh, interests, to protect the independence of public service media, to prevent regulators from taking political rulings against independent media, to end and to end the misuse of state advertising or other funds, uh, forms of funding to uh, to, to punish critical journalism. Now, the emperor is far from perfect, um, but it is strong on principles, and it may be a bit, a little bit short on teeth. Short, short on teeth. It, its teeth may be a bit blunt, 
But nevertheless, it does demonstrate that the EU has finally woken up to take, take, things, to take media freedom ser it seriously. And now it is about implementation. And it's up to us to, to do the best with the laws that we have before us. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think <laughs> it was, you had a lot to cover, Oliver. Uh, but I think this question around the implementation of the European Media Freedom Act is one that is critical. We're dealing with um, powerful interests. We're also de dealing with a lot of money. <laughs> Those powerful interests have a lot of money behind them. And exactly how the European Media Freedom Act is going to work in a number of EU contexts remains um, in question. Um, I want to know, I mean, uh, we, we can draw some of these questions now around media capture and also um, the role of uh, um, the state in protecting journalists better, but also this question of surveillance now by looking at Greece. Um, last year, the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders joined the Media Freedom Rapid Response, um, a group of um, press freedom NGOs um, who conduct missions to countries. We came here to Greece. Um, there was a report that came out of that which was very detailed. There were lots of recommendations looking at all of these issues. Um, and we, we, we're going to hand over to Tassos uh, Teloglu now, Greek investigative journalist, um, who, Tassos, I think you're very, very sort of disappointed, really, with, um, uh, let's be diplomatic here, but the lack of action taken by, uh, by your government, by the authorities. Could you talk us through um, what, what, your personal situation and some of your frustration? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, as you may know, uh, Greece is one of the European countries with soft institutions. Uh, that means that rules do not apply, and if they apply, they don't apply equally to everybody. So, and if they apply, uh, then they are applied very late to what has happened. State surveillance is, uh, against journalists is not a new thing. It has been previously recorded under other means. The new thing is that if you invite me for a dinner at your home and you are expressing your personal opinion and I have left this thing on the table, then most probably somebody is going to listen over your thoughts, ideas, and information you are sharing with me. And that's what makes the, the surveillance new and it gives uh, let's say, a, a, a total different quality vis-a-vis -vis what we have uh, experienced in the past. Uh, it was always in the uh, weaponry of the state uh, to gather information for, uh, through journalists for a very banal reasons, not only the very important reasons you, Ariane, uh, told us, but also for very banal reasons. These people think it's better to sit in their offices and listen to what we are fishing instead of going out and fishing themselves. So uh, if you have uh, 20, 30 journalists and you listen uh, the whole day on what they, they talk on and what they gather, then you have a pretty good picture and you, you provide a service to your government that knows the coming threats in, in terms of what's going to be public. So uh, the, the government, as you may know, in the surveillance scandal, um, said that uh, reasons of national security prohibited uh, main witnesses to speak out in the Parliamentary Inquiry Commission. They have uh, uh, taken through the judicial, the head of the, the judiciary, uh, the case from the lower uh, court to the higher court, although it was near the end of their uh, investigation. They were near the end of their investigation. And until now, nobody of the main figures have been invited to testify. On, on, on some other very important uh, uh, terrain, uh, the exports that have been done through Greece to Sudan, of spyware to Sudan, have uh, uh, are, are investigated for 14 months, although we know that the uh, guy who was in charge of the investigation has finished his report by January 2023. So we know what's in the report. 
we know, we have written, we have reported about the findings. They have a difficulty because the guy who was in charge uh, was transferred to the party echelons uh, and he's not accused. So they have a difference how to, to charge people who were under this guy, not this guy. So this is the main problem. So when you, you, you talk to them, they say they, they, still, they still investigate on that. But on, 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 on some other more important things, like, like the murder of uh, uh, my colleague Karabas, there, has been, there have been arrests prior to the elections. Elections play always a very important role. But uh, the, there hasn't been any uh, progress since then, since this, these people have been arrested on, I must say, on very thin evidence. Uh, um, so uh, uh, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, a, a result of the pressure from uh, international organization that brought this arrest, but I'm not optimistic that this case will, uh, will go on. So when uh, uh, the European organization asked the governments to protect journalists, I'm highly skeptical because we ask for protection. It's like uh, going to the butcher uh, on the Thanksgiving day to ask him to protect uh, the birds, you know? It's, it won't work. So uh, 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 the, uh, the, I, 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 I think that much more important is to, to strengthen the newsrooms, to strengthen the uh, uh, lawyers of the newsrooms, to strengthen the accountability of the heads of the newsrooms than to, to uh, 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 hope that the, this very government that is exercising those practices is going to, to protect us from itself. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, could you, there we are. Um, Sabots, uh, I think, told me once, and you know, we, we're now having this conversation about that question of uncertainty. If you're a journalist, and what you, how you actually can protect your sources, do you meet them in a park with a pen and paper? Is that the best way now of actually, if you want to avoid possible detection of what you're saying, is that the way to, to go about your jobs? So I think we are, you know, that 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 sort of uncertainty really is underpinning how, how journalists are having to make those decisions. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A part of the session now. Uh, for online participants, I would invite you to write your questions in the chat. Um, I will field them. Um, now, uh, I'm looking at the floor if people would like to raise questions. Uh, make comments, um, please uh, introduce yourself, introduce the name of your organization or who you are, and if it's directed to one of the panelists, please, please uh, also uh, tell us who you would like your question or comment directed to. Uh, in which case, um, it's, I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes to think about what their question is and take the pressure off you a bit. Um, uh, Sabo, uh, could you talk us through that, 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 that question now? I mean, um, you know, in Brussels, Hungary really is the focus of, of um, uh, if you like, a, uh, a, a, a difficult climate for, for journalists now to work in because of the level of media capture and also this question of surveillance. But how does, when, when you found out that you were under surveillance, how was, how was the conversation that you then had with your colleagues and how, did people start changing their, their way of operating? Well, when you work as an investigative journalist, you're already mindful of your communication, uh, or at least that's how you should, uh, how you should be. So the, the, the thing is that um, we were extensively relying on end-to-end -end encrypted uh, messaging applications when talking with each other when doing our, you know, editorial communications and also when uh, when contacting sources. Of course, already before it was uh, revealed to me that I was surveilled, already before that, 
most of my sensitive meetings were in-person in meetings. Uh, I didn't bring my phone or put the phone in a Faraday bag. So uh, I did whatever I could, but obviously it's not enough. So the old offline methods of, of yes, meeting in a park or meeting in any place where there's no surveillance cameras uh, around is a much better idea. Um, also, it's good if, if a journalist who's under surveillance or who, who suspects being under surveillance uh, learns about how the intelligence services in their countries operate, what kind of authority they have. For example, uh, in, in my case, uh, it seems it's much safer uh, when I'm operating from outside of the country because some of these authorities that were after me, they only have uh, the, um, uh, the the legal framework to, uh, to surveil within uh, Hungary. So whenever I leave the country, uh, I feel uh, more free to just uh, shut off the VPN on my phone if I want to stream something on Netflix, for example. It's not the case uh, in Hungary. Um, but but um, sticking to to offline meetings, leaving your phone behind, leaving your uh, your Apple Watch behind, uh, it's it's always a, a, a smart thing to do. Thanks, and I guess you know uh, we have questions from the floor. So. Um... Again, I would like, we have a roving mic, which is going to be, a roaming mic, which is going to be coming away. Can I, again, ask you to introduce yourselves and which organization you represent? So, uh, hello, I'm Andrea Campbell. I come from the EBU. Um, it's an interesting point that we had just now, and I think that's also the third part of the discussion that we're having today, is that technology is kind of the intermediary between governments and journalists these days that are enabling this surveillance. And I thought that's a bit of a gap in the discussion we've had so far. So the role of big tech, let's discuss. That's a, a very good question and perhaps also another session, but we're going to give our panelists just a moment to reflect on that. And there's a second question behind. Is it working? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Joanna Szymańska. I'm uh, from uh, Article 19. And I have a question to Sabolgs, um, because Polish um, journalists revealed yesterday that uh, uh, there's, there's been another tool used by the previous uh, government, not only Pegasus, but something called Hermes. And this is uh, when uh, many people heard about this uh, Hermes for the first time uh, yesterday. So I just wanted to, to ask if uh, you also, you, you, uh, you know about this uh, another tool uh, that uh, might uh, have been used also by other um, governments uh, or is it uh, something that now uh, we also need to look at more uh, in more detail and uh, uh, to understand if there are also other tools uh, in possession of uh, of uh, governments in in Europe that uh, have been used uh, to spy on uh, journalists and activists. Thank you. Okay, I'm just scanning. If there's another question, we could take a third before we conclude the session. But I think we'll. Um, uh, we will uh, first uh, go to Sabol. Uh, for, to, to respond um, to Article 19's question. Um, and then I'm going to open up the question around technology um, for, for, for the panel. Um, whoever would like to respond, do indicate. Uh, but firstly, uh, uh, Sabot, over to you. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've read, uh, read the article. And uh, the, the thing is that there are many other technologies around, most of which we're uh, currently unaware of. So, for example, when the Pegasus project was was revealing this scale of of surveillance with the Pegasus spyware back in 2021, uh, that covered a, a time frame of the late 2010s. So, whatever there is out there uh, used by intelligence services or whatever was used by the law and justice government just uh, you know a couple of uh, months ago could be revealed in the in the future. Also, the names of these uh, spivers and technologies vary uh, from country to country. Sometimes there are like white label versions. Sometimes they are sold under different names. Uh, what's most important is, uh, is I think, that uh, 
uh, to to stress that whatever technologies uh, there 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 are used against journalists, uh, it doesn't really matter because uh, these are uh, against the law and and these are against the you know uh, ethics of uh, of just how journalists and how the media uh, people should be uh, treated. Uh, I think that Poland is now in a somewhat fortunate position because at least uh, we would see or that, at least that's my expectation and I'm currently in Warsaw so I'm talking from Warsaw where I'm meeting with my, my local colleagues is that Poland could be the first case in the European Union where actually impunity could end and where the perpetrators and and where those who were ordering the surveillance of uh, of, of innocent people could be brought to, to justice so I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. And now we've got the question of the industry and the technology, which um, there are lots of angles. Tassos, over to you. So uh, I'm a little bit ambivalent on that because, of course, uh, the technology, um, the technological companies uh, are the first one that trace that something wrong is happening. Uh, somebody could tell that they are enabling through their products that. But on the other hand, I must tell you from the Greek experience that the big tech has contributed a lot to disguise the predator system for obvious reasons. When my colleague Thanasis Koukakis, first of all, let me tell you that when the Meta uh, report was in December, the December 16th, 2021, uh, uh, published, uh, uh, for the first time, my colleague Elisa Triandafilou, who is going to be later here with us, uh, discovered that uh, various functions of Intellexa group in Greece have shut down. So their, their, immediate, their immediate reaction was that they stopped doing what they've done in 2021 after the Meta report was published. Secondly, second, Meta was instrumental in helping Thanasis Koukakis to get fast results from the Media Lab in Toronto. They were interested in getting this result because if you are number 300 something between the Spanish Prime Minister and the widow of Khashoggi, you don't have a, a, a lot of chances to get fast results, but they were instrumental in having fast results uh, because Greece was, was a a hot, a, 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 a hot point in, 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 in predator's activity. So this is the second thing. And the third thing is that even Google at this time uh, has revealed some findings on uh, what they were doing in using uh, spyware uh, in, in cases uh, of, uh, of uh, Google operating phones. So at, at, uh, we, we had from, let's say, Meta and Google at this time, um, really good information and a really good contribution on how their, their products were misused. Now, what has happened next is something we don't know. The government was not very, was a, a reluctant and tried to talk to these companies and we don't know what has happened behind closed doors, but, uh, in overall, we say that they were instrumental in helping us to disguise what has happened in the years 2020 and 2021. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, can we... Jean-Paul Martos, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, in passing, I'm the editorial coordinator of the report, but just, just a remark, I mean, uh, uh, concerning the way we address those questions of our national security journalism, um, we tend to see as journalists uh, as a right to expose human rights abuses, which is committed either by democratic countries or with the help of democratic countries, which is a case that has been highlighted by Ariane in, in Egypt. But we have to see it much more than a right as a duty and if you remember what happened in the early 70s uh, when uh, the Washington Post and New York Times decided to publish the Pentagon Papers, 
they didn't really think in terms of their right to publish, but of their duty to publish. So we have to flip the guns. We have to make sure that we are on the offensive and not on the defensive in relation to our, go our own governments. I mean, it's, they are wrong. I mean, they, they, they are undermining democracy by suing journalists or raiding their homes or uh, hacking their phones. I mean, they are the ones that are guilty. We are not the ones that are guilty because we tend to be, I think, too defensive. I think we have to make sure that we, we have a duty to report because if we define press freedom as the right of the people to know questions that are of public interest and questions that are defining who we are as a democracy, we have a duty to report. We have a duty to report especially human rights abuses that are committed by democracies that there's no way we have to take it only as a right, but it's a duty to us, the people. Just a remark on this. Uh, I'm going to invite the panelists to respond just after one more question from the front and then uh, and after that a quick response from panelists who want to respond and then we're going to conclude and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Ariane to Uh, yes, uh, I completely agree with uh, what you just said. Uh, we have to flip our mind uh, and not to be on the on the defensive uh, sides. This is how we th thought uh, with this clause when we published the story and the document. Uh, we it's our responsibility to reveal the story, and if we don't do it, we fail. We fail in our mission of uh, um, putting on the public space, uh, public sphere uh, information that are in uh, the general interest. So we, uh, so the offense is on the side of the attackers, is on the side of the government who is attacking the right to uh, information, and we. Are, we have to publish the story. We don't publish st state secret because we like uh, uh, to put uh, state secret uh, on, on the public space. We just public publish lies or uh, stories that matter to the public, that help the public to hold accountable their, their, their leaders. Uh, so yes, I really agree that we have to stop being, oh, please, let me publish something. <laughs> uh, we publish because it is in the public interest. Full stop. I mean, I just want to come in now because I think that there's a really interesting angle here around investigative journalists and being able to access certain information. So if we take the industry um, around spyware, you know, you have the dual use um, export regulation from the EU, which should in principle give people a better access or understanding around tenders on the sort of export of uh, equipment or surveillance equipment that could be used in third countries to spy on journalists. Again, what we need there is transparency. And again, I think we also have this question around beneficial ownership registers as well, that actually what journalists need is, is, is better access so, and investigative journalists aren't necessarily getting that. And we're gonna talk about in, this in the next session, but there's pressure now on the journalists, right? It's for journalists to get this right. Um, and again, that's um, with, with uh, the, the threat of legal suits, with the, the, the pressure of media capture, with um, environments which are hostile against um, investigative journalists. This is, this is a real uphill struggle. So um, uh, we have a question from the front. And then if there are other questions, let me know now, because technically we should be drawing this panel to a close. Uh, Thank you. Uh, William Horsley, Association of European Journalists. I'll be uh, on there later, but I thought I'd ask uh, Ricardo Wallace to just to look quickly at the situation in places like Turkey and the former Yugoslavia. The platform report has uh, not been picking on particular countries as, as, as a chapter in, in the report, but those areas, uh, the journalists are most in need, uh, lack any kind of protection, and yet they, they need the uh, membership of the institutions, the EU, the Council of Europe, and there are means to try to support them to get the very basic protection mechanisms going, the legal frameworks. Uh, wh what more can be done that could be useful? Um, thank you, William. Um, I will let Oliver reply on Turkey because he's m much more aware than myself on the situation on, on Turkey. What I can say about Turkey is that we, we have now much less journalists in prison. You know, it was a real issue five years ago. We, we had uh, 120 journalists in prison. I think it's 40, uh, 30 right now. So the, the situation is not uh, as bad as it was. Of course, 
these journalists, you know, they were released because they, they uh, just applied <laughs> the sentence uh, they were condemned to. In the Balkans, I'm optimistic because we have, in most of the Balkan countries, very strong journalist organizations, you know. They are fighting for rights uh, and, and they are um, achieving some progress, you know. They launch their own platform. There is a regional platform uh, monitoring uh, the press vi uh, freedom violations in, in, in the region. Uh, they are very active, uh, very strong organizations. Um, if, if I can maybe summarize it, in, in Western uh, Europe, we are trying to protect our rights. In their side, they are uh, achieving new, new rights. They are you know, uh, managing to... to uh, to get new uh, improvement of their conditions. So, of course, uh, working conditions are very difficult for them, uh, specifically uh, freelance uh, journalists, but I think they are fighting and showing us that it's possible to improve the situation if, if, if you want to put pressure on governments, if you want to, um, I, I think, have a kind of uh, alliance with the civil society is really important uh, as well to improve the situation. But I'm, I'm not so pessimistic about uh, the Balkans. Maybe it's a bit more balanced, I would say, or difficult in Turkey, Oliver. Well, I mean, we could dedicate the rest of the day to Turkey. Um, but, 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 but the useful thing about Turkey is it sort of, it, it makes the link between um, uh, be, be, be between that and, uh, and big tech um, because one of the key issues there is the role of the platforms in censoring online content and in fact thanks to I think Katia in the audience over there drafted a fantastic statement just a couple of days ago putting out as we are approaching the uh, regional elections taking place at the end of this month an appeal to the platforms to, to, to stand firm against the um, all of the orders coming out from the government to remove journalistic content or, or, or whatever they define as harmful content or extreme content. They claim, of course, that you're making the link to the European, uh, to, to the European institutions, and of course Turkey does not, certainly does, does not want to give the impression of caring at all about what the European institutions have to say, but they do find it useful when there are, are new um, uh, forms of regulation that come in that they think Ah, okay. In Germany, we have a we have a law that that, that, that deals with harmful content online, or that the um, Digital Services Act is dealing with harmful content online. It gives them an excuse to then create their own harmful content uh, online uh, laws, which are much much more regressive. Um, partly because of the simple lack of um, of, of an independent uh, uh, judiciary, but they justify it on the basis of what's taking place in the EU. So we do appeal to EU. Uh, policymakers to always bear that in mind as they're constructing regulation with all the sort of checks and balances that we hope that we still have in Europe. You have to be very careful about the principles that you are potentially bending or breaking as you, uh, and, and how that might be misused or abused abroad. But so that makes the, the, the link to the question about big, te big tech. I was going to say it's on big tech. I remember going to one conference in The Guardian after the Edward Snowden affair talking about security online and the, the commentary was that the biggest weakness uh, in, in communications was the bit between, between the keyboard and the chair, i the human. And I think, you know, what, bit what Zabo was saying, um, the responsibility has got to be on the journalists to equip, equip themselves with the knowledge and the training on how to communicate safely. And that requires going back to pen, pen and paper, then, then, then so be it. But that means it really is up, is up to us to do that. And just coming back to um, uh, Jean-Paul's last point, I mean, I, I, I totally agree about the, the difference between rights and duties, and we often make that mistake. I think particularly when we talk about protection of sources, too, too often we frame it as the right of journalists to protect our source, but it's not. It's the duty, and we make that. We do make that mistake too often. So you're, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, look, um, the session was supposed to last an hour, and I think that once we start to delve into the responsibilities of big tech to mitigate risks posed to journalists um, and how we see that advocacy, we could last another hour potentially. So um, I'd just like to uh, thank the panelists.
Um, but in particular, Sabo, um, Arian, and, and Tassos, look, our platform is, is there to support you. Um, we're delighted to have you uh, speak today. Um, you know, it's really important uh, for us to have this event where we actually get to hear from journalists themselves um, and that you support our work and that we work in collabor collaboration. So thank you again. Um, I'm going to ask the panellists for the next panel now to um, come up and um, thank you once again. We can. There we go. Uh, we'll have just a minute interlude, thanks. The next panel, as I said, we're looking at some of the issues that we as platform partners think are very important to be talking about this year. Um, now, one of those issues, as I mentioned before, is strategic lawsuits against public participation. The work of the Coalition Against Slaps in Europe case, of which CPJ and I think a lot of the platform partners are, are, are a member of, really has been doing incredible work over the last few years in terms of documenting slaps cases around Europe. Um, these lawsuits bully journalists, um, and we're going to hear from uh, Flutura Kusari from the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom. Um, and uh, Jessica Nivani. Nivani, I just wanted to double check that. Uh, Jessica Nivani um, from Index on Censorship, uh, who are going to talk us through now that we, we, we've, seen, we've seen legislation, we've seen decis decisions and action taken by the Council of Europe and the EU, but where is that going to go? Um, so, Flutura, can you, can you get us started? Talk us through it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be as brief as possible. I'll mention some of the cases that we've documented and I'll conclude with some recommendations that, that we have. Um, media freedom and freedom of expression continue to be hindered by legal actions, including strategic lawsuits against public participation, which were initiated by politicians, businessmen, and other powerful entities. As you know, slaps are baseless and disproportionate lawsuits filed against journalists and activists with the sole aim to intimidate or discourage them from public participation. Last year, journalists and media outlets were sued for defamation, their assets were frozen, and they faced fines by regulatory bodies. Of course, some cases stood out. In Serbia, the mayor of Belgrade, Aleksandar Šapić, sued Bern, Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, after they revealed he had not registered a house worth um, almost 1 million euros. In Slovakia, political party Smer sued three political commentators after they criticized the party and its president, Robert Fico, who currently serves a pro as a prime minister. Several alerts, which were documented by the platform, contained hallmarks of slaps. In the Netherlands, the newspaper with a difficult name, Het Financial Dagbald, FD, received a summon from William Blittorp founder and majority shareholder of the wholesale company B&S, over two articles. The claimant sought the removal of both articles, a correction, and 150,000 euros in, dam in damages. He claimed, amongst other things, that FD approached too many persons with questions about the case and that the questions were allegedly suggestive and partially incorrect. He did not like the fact that the media outlet were trying to verify the facts before publishing them. Bulgarian insurance company Lev Inns sued Mediapol in Bulgaria seeking half a million euros for reputational damage. Mediapol had written about a public interest matter connected to Green Card. Two months ago, the case was dismissed. The alerts show that the legal base used for slaps and abusive processes are usually national laws on protection of reputation, which can be either criminal or um, civil defamation, insult and libel. This corresponds with the finding of a recent report from the Coalition Against Slaps in, in Europe. Tom mentioned the contribution of case in um, anti-slap uh, uh, fight in Europe, which found that the large majority of lawsuits are based on national defamation laws or similar provisions. Journalists also faced 
legal proceedings which in their nature are abusive. For example, in an Italian defamation case, the prosecutor, and this is also a little bit funny, but serious, ordered the seizure of a hard copy of the indicted article in the Domani newspaper, even though the contested article was available online. Criminal defamation remains a serious concern in several countries in Europe. In Poland, the police initiated a criminal investigation in connection with an article published by Noja Gazeta, Trezebnicka and Gazeta Joborska. The article alleged that Anna Morawicka, the prime minister's sister, <coughs> held a fictitious, fictitious position in the um, Trez, Trez, Trebeznica town hall. Uh, and there are also other um, uh, cases. It's worth mentioning that regulatory proceedings are also being used against journalists with alerts being registered in Poland and Hungary, and you have all the details in the report. The situation we've documented previously and we documented last year is alarming, with ab abusive lawsuits and slaps being used across Europe. However, there are positive developments which will have hopefully a major impact in fighting slaps in Europe. Um, as many of you might be aware, the European Union approved last week the anti slap directive, known as Daphne's Law. Although limited to civil cases only, Daphne's Law will provide protection for all those who engage in public participation on matters of public interest, including journalists. Um, in addition, we hopeful, hopefully we, we will hear positive news from the Council of Europe as well. Last December, the CDMSI, which is the committee in charge of media affairs within Council of Europe, um, agreed to transmit to the Committee of Ministers the draft recommendation and the draft uh, explanatory memo memorandum. Year 2024 will be the year when we finally will have some minimum standards on anti slap for such standards to be implemented, we need political will from member states at national level. We hope member states will start drafting legislation and policy to counter slaps. And if there are good initiatives, there will be a second European anti-slap conference on 14th of November in collaboration with Council of Europe and hopefully with the new European Parliament. So we invite you to save the date, 14th of November, 2024 will all be there. And lastly, if you're a journalist and face legal action, please get in touch with ECPMF, FPU, and other organizations. We have money to cover lawyers' fees and we'll be happy to, to help you. Read the report, share it with your government, and help us to push for implementation of recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. And um, again, the, the work of civil society around around the documenting of the cases has been incredible. And I actually have a question that I, I want to ask you, Flutter, about. I'm going to wait till Jessica um, uh, has told us about what's happening in the UK. And then I think what we're going to do is we'll talk slaps for the first part of this panel, and then we'll move on to the other subjects. Jessica, over to you. Um, yes, thanks, Tom, um, and thanks, Victoria, for laying the groundwork, because um, something that has come up a lot is, in the context of the European, um, the, in Case's work, is um, the UK. Um, the UK has long been highlighted as the slap capital of Europe. Um, since 2020, eight media freedom alerts related to slaps have been filed um, on the UK, on the Council of Europe platform, and we know that these only begin to scratch the surface. Two cases, uh, one against freelance journalist Malachy O'Doherty in Belfast and one against two uh, OCCRP, Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project journalists in London, um, have already had judgments in their favour since the beginning of this year. But we need protective measures to be put in place to prevent journalists from being dragged through the courts at great costs, not only in terms of money, but in terms of time and energy too. And as Flutura has outlined, in the EU now, there's this landmark, landmark Daphne's law, but that, of course, will not apply in the UK. So since the establishment in 2021 of the UK Anti-SAP Coalition, which also counts several platform partners as members, we've been calling um, on the government, on the UK government, to enact comprehensive anti-SAP measures that can protect all public watchdogs, including journalists, from being legally harassed by means of the UK legal system. The British courts have been used to intimidate and harass, as I said, not only journalists in the UK, but right around Europe and beyond. 
In 2022, the UK government made a commitment to bring forward legislative measures um, to stamp out slaps, and last October, an anti-slap amendment was adopted in the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act. However, this amendment only applies to public watchdogs who are calling out or investigating economic crime. So we have since then been calling for a standalone anti-slap law that can protect all public watchdogs, no matter what public interest issue is at hand. So since the report went to print, um, it's, it's actually this, the UK is specifically highlighted on page 56, and since that went to print, a standalone anti-slap bill has been put forward, I'm very glad to say, which um, effectively expands the, the mechanism in the Economic Crime and Tr Corporate Transparency Act to all public watchdogs, so to all public interest um, issues as well. So, um, and while we have welcomed that proposed legislation which was put forward by the MP Wayne David. We are calling for much needed amendments to be adopted in order to really strengthen the bill and make sure that it's effective. So as it stands, the early dismissal mechanism um, in the bill introduces an unnecessary element of complexity and uncertainty by requiring the intention of the slap filer to, to be identified first. So this means that the mechanism can only be triggered if the lawsuit has been identified as a slap. But what is a slap? The model anti-slap law put forward by the UK Anti-Slap Coalition uses a more objective test by identifying features of, features of abuse or features of concern. So we're calling on the UK government now to consider amendments that would offer a similar approach, which will make the early dis mechanism in the, in the legislation, which an early, dis mechanism, early dismissal mechanism is a key feature in any anti-slap law. It would make it more, um, well, more effective by making it less complex, less costly, and therefore more accessible to public watchdogs. As outlined in, report, in the report, there are also um, important non-legislative measures that are being used to counter slaps in the UK. Uh, for example, um, through the government-led Slaps Task Force, uh, which also several um, members are involved in, several partners are involved in, involved in, and through the Solicitors Regulation Authority, which regulators solicitors in the UK. Awareness raising around SLAPs remains an essential part of our work, and it's key to building solidarity among public watchdogs, delegitimising um, legal harassment and overall strengthening media freedom. And as Flutura has said already, as part of that awareness raising, we're really um, calling on journalists still to, to be in touch with us if you have a case, because um, highlighting cases is one of the ways that we've been able to make the progress that we have over recent years and hopefully how we will continue as well along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you actually answered my question a little bit because I'm really interested in this question around censorship and journalists who um, receive a letter um, and um, are terrified about what this actually means for their work. They could be getting that letter without any legal advice, without any assistance or knowledge of what civil society can do. So I guess the question that I have is how much is the reporting that the Coalition Against Slaps in Europe has done, how much of this is the tip of the iceberg? And we see, and I guess, almost a, a sort of acceleration or a, a, an increase now in the amount of cases reported. So um, when we're talking about the UK and information campaigns, it's also the European Commission's SLAP recommendation, which um, hasn't necessarily got the attention that the anti-SLAP directive has, but also includes um, uh, you know, a request to member states, it's not binding, um, to, to increase these sort of information awareness. Is it enough? I mean, as uh, the coalition against SLAPs in, in Europe, I mean, are, are we reaching, is, is a reach enough? Um, what can we do that's more and how can we be more ambitious? So we do have a lot of cases across Europe which were documented either by CASE or European Parliament because they ordered some, some, so they organized research by individual organizations, etc. What we don't know is how many stories were stopped and didn't get published because of slaps. And this is my personal op opinion based on the legal support we offer with, with ECPMF, but most of the stories are not published. Still, uh, the suggestion and the recommendation and the advice coming either from the media outlets or from lawyers is that they should not publish the cases. Sometimes it's for good reasons. In some legal systems, it's better to be more careful. 
sometimes my impression is that they don't know how to organize publication of this information, and the result is that we can't document these cases. It's, first and foremost, it was very difficult to convince the Council of Europe and the European Commission to come up with policies, because all they wanted to hear about was numbers and concrete cases. And now this has become more important. If we want to push member states, be that at Council of Europe level or European Commission uh, member states, to come up with legislation, we need to continue to document cases of, of slaps. And really, there are so many ways to do it, be that by Council of Europe platform uh, coming directly to us or, or mapping media freedom or index or several organizations are, are doing this. We need to continue to document slap cases if we want these basic minimal standards that are about to be established by the Commission and the Council to be implemented at national level. Do, you have a, uh, do we have any other questions or comments about SLAPS? Ariane. case in France a journalist was just um, con uh, condemned to pay 150,000 euros uh, Jean-Baptiste Rivoire is an investigative journalist he was condemned by a court a law, um, uh, labor court uh, because he signed a, a, a non-disclosure agreement uh, with his company uh, and then it criticized uh, the system. It's a, it's a, a, a um, Canal Plus. It was a company that was owned by a far right uh, billionaire. Uh, and um, so the, the, this uh, court condemned him to, to 150,000 euros to pay to this uh, big company uh, just because he, ex he used his freedom of expression. Uh, so I, don't, I would like to know if we can use uh, the anti-slap uh, law to um, cancel this decision or to contest this decision or to, to, to fight back. So I will refrain from giving uh, an answer because we really need to know the details. In principle, from what you said, I think we would be able to support the journalists, whether, it, whether this case is a slap it's, um, we need the information of the entire case. What was uh, the, the com what were the comments about, etc. cetera. Uh, but we would be very happy to, to look at the case and also to provide some uh, maybe financial assistance as well. Yeah, thank you for raising that. I think it, it, is, it is part of the ecosystem as well that facilitates SLAPs. You know, we also think about, I mean, we're referring to Daphne's law and we're thinking about you know, um, a kind of a creating an enabling environment for journalists is really important. So there's several different aspects, but NDAs in terms of an enabling environment for SLAPs is something that has come up a lot um, in recent years. And I would say it's something that's um, more on a parallel track. So um, on, uh, for example, in the US uh, and which extended to Europe, the Me Too movement, NDAs were really rife as part of that too and stopped a lot of um, a lot of information from coming to light and they were used hand in hand, they went hand in hand with SLAP so it's something that has come up quite a bit so there's, there's a campaign as well um, in terms of NDAs against NDAs called Can't Buy My Silence which um, in the UK Anti-SLAP Coalition we've been engaging with because it is something that is, it's part of the ecosystem for sure that is, um, is stopping an enabling environment for media freedom and not only for journalists as well. Okay, I'm just looking at the audience and uh, I do invite people online uh, with questions to do put them in the chat and we can field them. Um, we can move on now from, from SLAPS. Um, uh, last October, the, uh, the, the platform partners um, were in Riga for the launch of the Journalists Matter campaign, which we're going to get to in a sec, but we were also um, able to um, uh, meet with uh, Russian Russian journalists in exile, and we, we're going to be talking. We're going to be moving on now to um, the implications of the war in Ukraine as it drags on. 
um, on press freedom, but also try to address this question of journalists in exile, um, including, I think, two questions. Firstly, how journalists move to countries and the support that they get in that process of moving in terms of visas, but also th this question of professional support once they arrive in that country. Um, as a platform, what we want to do is to be able to support journalists in doing their job by making sure that governments can take measures um, to, to provide stability, um, both in terms of that technical support to moving to the country, but also ways that they can allow them to work. Um, so we're going to firstly hear from the Justice for Journalists Foundation, uh, Maria Mohojonadzigitse, um, forgive my pronunciation, but Maria, if, if you um, could talk us uh, through your work, um, and, and then we're going to hear from uh, um, uh, Irina, another journalist, to talk about her, um, her, her, her experience in exile. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, we've uh, heard some quite harrowing uh, testimonies in the first part of this uh, session about how the journalists are being treated by their own home countries, uh, even the most democratic ones, or con those who are considered the most democratic ones. Uh, in this uh, introduction, I would like to talk about uh, exile journalists and the journalists who are being driven into exile uh, from uh, non-democratic regimes uh, into other uh, Council of Europe countries that are considered democratic. And of course, the main reasons for them fleeing uh, are three. First of all, is uh, physical danger to their life and uh, liberty. Second is legal, legal persecution. And uh, third is harassment, threats, and intimidation, including cyber attacks. Um, independent journalists and active political activists are uh, historically considering um, Europe as a safe place and uh, the place that would welcome them and provide necessary material and security protection. However, it is not always the case, and I will speak about that uh, in more details in the second part of my inter intervention. Uh, I will start with the, the, the problem kind of that didn't start yesterday. Uh, even um, in, back in 2021, uh, when uh, uh, Taliban um, invaded in 2021, uh, a, a record number of Afghan journalists had to leave Afghanistan in search of safety, uh, including and le left to US and, uh, and Europe. Uh, in February 2023, the citizenship of over 200 Nicaraguan political opponents and dissidents, including media workers, uh, was cancelled as they were accused of spreading false news and conspiracy to undermine national identity. And the Spanish government in that case offered citizenship to exiled journalists, uh, which can be uh, viewed as a very positive example. Uh, in uh, different European countries, exiled media outlets and journalists have uh, resumed their work, including uh, media workers from Sudan, Iran, Syria, Myanmar, Burundi, and uh, Pakistan. Uh, Turkish journalists, who we mentioned earlier today as well, uh, have been uh, seeking refuge in Europe, mainly in Germany, for many years now. The situation has not improved this year, as the autocratic government invents new quasi-legal tools to get hold of them in order to shut down the truthful reporting. Uh, for example, the exiled Turkish journalist Khan Dundar revealed that he had been added to the so-called terrorist grey list, a database published by the Turkish Interior Minister, Ministry that identifies alleged terrorists and offers rewards for their capture. Uh, in addition to, to him, there are 14 other Turkish journalists in this list. According to the Belarusian Association of Journalists, uh, at least 400 uh, Belarusian independent journalists have, uh, for, have been forced into immigration since 2020, uh, following the protests after the rigged presidential elections in, in this country. They settled primarily in the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, but uh, Alexander Lukashenko, the dictator, uh, also continues to think of ways to get them back to prisons in Belarus, where already currently 33 journalists are being uh, held serving their time. In September 2023, Belarus banned its citizens from being able to renew their passports from outside the country. In addition, Belarusian journalists in exile can now be stripped of their citizenship if they were previously convicted uh, on anti-state charges. Since the Russian full-scale invasion in Ukraine, according to a Moscow Times report, over 1,000 1, journalists were forced to leave Russia, 
most of them to European countries, including Armenia, Czech Republic, Georgia, Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, and Netherlands, Poland, and Turkey. Uh, Russia has imprisoned at least 33 media workers, including American journalists Evan Gershkovich and Alsu Kurmashova, plus 14 journalists were captured and in occupied Crimea, tried and imprisoned in Russian prison camps. Uh, the torturous conditions of those uh, modern gulag places are now widely publicized following the death of Alexei Navalny. Numerous legal acts and restrictions, including lengthy prison terms for dissemination of false information about the Russian armed forces, made it impossible to report the truth from inside Russia, and media workers have to either quit journalism altogether or immigrate. It is important to note that exiled journalists uh, continue to be subjected to various risks and threats even inside the Council of Europe states. There have been reports of physical attacks, kidnappings, and even assassination attempts uh, in journalist countries of, exi of exile. Their family members back at home also become the target of attacks, and they frequently find themselves in hostage situation back home. Out of the most concerning attacks, I would like to mention, to mention two cases of suspected poisonings of Russian female media workers, Yelena Kostuchenko and Irina Boblayan, and three cases of surveillance and doxing also involving uh, female journalists inside uh, Marfa Smirnova and I stories, Alessia Morakovska and uh, Irina Dalinina, who will uh, speak after me. Um, and these journalists are, to this day, uh, are and subjected, endlessly subjected to the stream of insults and bullying uh, and uh, are constantly uh, openly followed uh, on the streets of uh, Tbilisi and Prague respect respectively and receiving numerous death threats uh, for the reporting and the campaigning they do. One would think that their new host countries would be motivated to eliminate such criminal behavior towards political refugees in their territory. However, sadly, this is not the case. The crimes against these journalists are not being investigated, and in the case of Irina, uh, Czech police closed the case because, uh, and I quote, it was impossible to find out the facts that would justify the initiation of criminal proceeding against a specific person. So basically, the police said we're not doing our work and not intend to do it. Other challenges that the exiled uh, media workers are facing in many of their host countries, and this is in addition to the police in action, are lack of uh, financial support, legal and visa, visa constraints, addition, and in addition, um, they um, in introduce new visa constraints and, and uh, problems and additional challenges for the journalists to, to be able to move in and settle in the new countries. Uh, Non-acceptance of the local media communities and psychological strain that comes with it. It is important that Council of Europe countries, together with media freedom NGOs, dedicate resources to assist the exiled media, as this problem is not going away. And without the truthful reporting from places like Turkey and Russia, all we would hear would be lie and propaganda. Thank you. Thanks, and we're going to move quickly to Irina Dolinina um, from Ice Stories. Um, thank you, like, thank you for coming, thank you for presenting. We as platform partners want to be able to support you, um, so um, the floor is yours. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I will talk a little about our experience. Uh, firstly, when uh, our media, Important Stories, when we were working in Russia, of course, we were working under pressure because we were independent and uh, we covered uh, corruption. Uh, we exposed a lot of uh, corrupt officials in Russia and uh, including even the inner circle of Putin and uh, his uh, family members. And uh, because of that, we were labeled one of the first like foreign agent and it's just labeled like an enemy of regime and uh, me myself I personally was also labeled for an agent like more than three years ago now uh, we were under cyber attacks we were under surveillance um, our colleagues uh, uh, have been arrested their homes have been raided uh, on the first day of full-scale uh, invasion of Russia into Ukraine I was arrested twice uh, during just one day for doing my job and asking people on the border with Ukraine uh, do they want this war and uh, are they afraid what uh, do they think about it and uh, after that we understood that uh, now it's uh, we, we were under risk and uh, of course uh, working in Russia even uh, 
uh, till the war started, a uh, full-scale war. But uh, after it started, we understand that uh, now uh, it will be it would be impossible for us to stay uh, if we want to, to spend uh, our lives not in prison but uh, continue uh, our work. And after we uh, escaped Russia, uh, it was a mistake to felt relief uh, and to felt safe because uh, uh, once we thought that uh, we were uh, helped with the visas and we helped to legalize uh, in Europe uh, so we supported here and uh, um, as an uh, uh, independent journalist and um, as basically political refugees, because uh, it's not uh, relocation or uh, as someone called it, because we were just basically we were running from the country, just picking <coughs> our baggages uh, in one day. Uh, and uh, we continued our work uh, also, of course, on corruption, on abuse of power in Russia, but uh, we uh, prioritized our topics, of course, on uh, war criminals uh, that uh, Russia, Russian soldiers, Russian army uh, c committed and still is committing uh, in Ukraine. And uh, Russian authorities obviously uh, didn't like that uh, uh, we were doing it. Um, I was uh, making uh, a lot of interviews, for example, with, with uh, Russian soldiers who refused to continue uh, participating in this war and uh, they explained why they consider this war also is uh, uh, being a criminal. Uh, after that, uh, just uh, uh, several of these interviews uh, uh, I published just uh, maybe in uh, just in one month or two, because you know it's just uh, you published one, then uh, another soldier uh, uh, read it, reads it and wants also to talk, and it was just uh, um, just rough for several months. I uh, noticed uh, surveillance in Prague. Uh, sometimes it, it was not uh, very obvious, but uh, what uh, I was really shocked about that. Uh, even uh, one evening, me and my colleagues and from other outlets or just activists, we were under obvious surveillance. It's like when you're just sitting and people uh, sitting next to you, they're looking into you, then they follow you in the streets. And that's what I uh, experienced only in Russia. I was surprised that it's happening in Europe. But uh, then we... Uh, I received uh, and my colleague Alessia the threats that uh, included uh, our addresses at Prague, as Maria told, like personal addresses of uh, our flats in Prague. And then uh, uh, during the half of the year, we just constantly got uh, threats uh, with uh, some psychological abuse that uh, you'll be punished for all you write and it was uh, with uh, this uh, symbol of uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine, Z. So it was, uh, uh, we, we couldn't mistake in uh, it. It was on also, oh, of course, for our work and of course for our covering uh, this war. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, of course we uh, got used not to uh, uh, believe so much uh, in the police because we've been living in Russia our whole, whole life, but uh, uh, we thought that uh, uh, right now we published it and uh, um, it's kind of pressure also on the uh, Czech police, on Czech government, that uh, everyone is uh, knows that uh, Russian independent journalists are under surveillance uh, uh, there, but uh, uh, yes, one day I just uh, we just uh, knew that uh, without any announcement, Czech police closed uh, the case, um, and um, uh, I can't uh, comment uh, the work, and maybe uh, they uh, couldn't uh, progress in uh, doing something uh, in this investigation. But what I can say from my point of view that it's. Uh, a huge mistake and it's very bad sign to all these agents 
who are just obviously going in the streets of Prague uh, behind us, who, are, uh, who know our flats. It's a huge sign that we don't care, we don't consider it seriously. Uh, we just open a case formally, just because a lot of journalists are calling to us, to our press uh, uh, service and asking what, what, what happening. Okay, we opened case, but then we closed it. We don't consider these uh, threats seriously. And uh, uh, right now, after Navalny was killed uh, in jail, uh, it can also be a sign that uh, uh, there can be more uh, harassment, at least, or even killings uh, uh, of uh, oppositional and uh, leaders uh, uh, outside Russia, and uh, it can affect also and activists and journalists. Uh, and Maria mentioned cases of uh, poisoning, and uh, uh, they not only knew our flats uh, in Prague, they also sent our information about our flights uh, uh, around Europe with uh, just seats in the plane and our reservation in a hotel and uh, just like we know that uh, not only where you live in Europe but also we can follow you around uh, Europe. So yeah, it's my concern and uh, in a proof uh, to the words that uh, it's really important right now to make something before they uh, go to the next stage uh, and to do something to us. Just to, this Sunday evening I was, uh, I got a call from uh, my colleague from other independent Russian media, uh, who also uh, based in Prague. And uh, they told uh, also about obvious surveillance in Prague. Just a car is uh, slowly uh, following uh, a journalist and uh, turning all the ways uh, uh, after him, and I'm 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 surprised that uh, it can happen. Uh, and they just uh, these agents, they feel so comfortable there, and uh, police is also just uh, uh, make them more comfortable by closing our cases and uh, doing nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have questions for Maria and Irina from the audience? Hi, um, Anna Braca with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, thank you very much, Irina, for being here uh, today and sharing uh, your experience. Um, really sorry about what you have been going through. And I wanted to ask you a question about your work, about how, given all what you said, and given that Important Stories, your outlet, has been uh, labeled an undesirable organization in Russia for, I think, more than two years now, I wanted to ask you how it impacted your work, uh, since it's uh, basically banning the outlet from operating in Russia, putting at risk a journal its journalists, but also the sources. So how have you been able to uh, continue your work and also another question about um, what's next for uh, Russian journalists in exile given that we know that the transnational repression from Russian authorities is only increasing, journalists getting arrested in absentia, putting on wanted lists, uh, convicted to lengthy prison sentence uh, in absentia and also their prop property now in Russia is being seized so what's next for uh, Russian journalists in exile, and um, what can be next after the indesirable uh, label, what may be extremist label, so yeah, what do you think about it? Thank you. It's uh, definitely a huge topic, so uh, I'll be trying to be quick. Uh, and uh, yeah, I forgot even to mention our next label because <laughs> we just uh, uh, just so bent uh, in Russia. We after we were labeled foreign agent, they thought it's it's not enough for our media, and uh, they called us um, admitted us as undesirable organization. And uh, just I can't not to mention the fact that uh, this decision was made two days before. Russia invaded Ukraine, so they just prepared, you know, this uh, uh, 
uh, all shutdown of independent media in Russia. And uh, undesirable organization basically means that uh, uh, our media is a uh, illegal organization in Russia and everyone who is working, not anonymously, uh, for this organization, uh, they uh, uh, they will be prosecuted in Russia and uh, going to jail for that. Uh, and um, yeah, it was um, we were we were one of the uh, first media who was uh, were labeled undesirable organization. So we uh, have had to develop uh, new methods of uh, work and how to speak uh, with people in Russia. Because if you just give a, even a brief comment to undesirable organization, just, okay, yeah, I saw it, and uh, uh, this is my name, for example, you're just witness of something, you also can um, can be uh, prosecuted in Russia by law, because uh, you are like a supporting uh, activity of undesirable organization. So this uh, basically is just... Uh, uh, a law that uh, uh, forbids journalistic work, uh, but uh, we, uh, I think, we managed to, to develop uh, a lot of new methods of uh, working and talking with people uh, without putting uh, them under risk, uh, and uh, at least uh, no, none of us. Are our sources and characters so far are not in jail. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, and um, um, I think that um, it was hard, and for us, uh, it also hard to spread information, and uh, it's our main goal. Because if uh, you, uh, a Russian uh, who just repost uh, the material, uh, the article of undesirable organization also can be uh, punished, fined firstly, and after, for example, second reports, it will be a criminal case. Uh, so it's uh, hard for us to talk with people, uh, with experts, it's hard for us uh, to spread information, but uh, still we survive. But uh, mm, I just, uh, uh, sorry, but I stopped to uh, speak about uh, future <laughs> so far and prognosis, because I just don't have them, and uh, we are dealing every time with uh, some uh, this um, everyday uh, problems like uh, uh, how to protect uh, our sources, how to protect our families, and uh, how not uh, to be killed uh, even in exile. So I'm just uh, don't have time to think about the future of journalism. I think we just work every day uh, while we can work, and it's my main uh, goal right now. Uh, but uh, I'm just afraid that they will go after our parents uh, who are hostages, as uh, Maria said, uh, uh, in Russia. It's uh, just my fear, but uh, I want to believe that it's not a prognosis. Uh, we have time for a quick question, if it can be a quick question. Thanks. Are we okay? I will speak like that. Are we doing enough to support you? Uh, is the journalist community, is the new union doing enough to uh, support you? Uh, uh, because so far we, I feel, we failed. So, is in terms of activism, are we doing enough? Mm. It's hard to say. I think yes, because I feel the uh, support. We were, we were silenced about, uh, for example, threats for a long time, because uh, uh, we, um, maybe maybe it was a mistake, but we just got uh, used to work under pressure, and we thought that uh, it's just uh, like, uh, uh, you, you just, uh, if you're a Russian independent journalist, it's uh, just okay if you are facing uh, such, uh, uh, such pressure so but uh, then we when we uh, published this information we got a lot of support of uh, many different organizations from journalistic society uh, but uh, I can't uh, um, uh, really understand if they also had uh, 
uh, some mm, uh, power uh, to influence uh, authorities because I'm just afraid that uh, uh, without uh, uh, pressure on authorities uh, it's only like for me it's only a psychological pl pleasure and I feel supported because uh, the last threat we got after we published was about and how is the investigation of Czech police is going on. Don't uh, funny people like how funny. Don't uh, d uh, it's like it's funny. So it was like abuse, yeah. But uh, it, they were right uh, that uh, yes, it, it wasn't going anywhere. So um, uh, and uh, but uh, a lot of articles were published about it in Czech language, in many language. I I just. Uh, Maybe a month I was given only interviews and it was translated like in uh, every language in European uh, nation countries. Uh, but uh, still, like uh, uh, as I told uh, that uh, just uh, several days ago, again in Prague, it was just obvious case, like, like we in Moscow, you know, just we can go and follow you in the streets. So, uh, but uh, uh, of course I... Uh, always grateful for all support and still uh, 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 yeah sorry <laughs> uh, thank you for questions and uh, for support look I'm really I'm really sorry for for, for cutting you short there as a moderator uh, again I'd like to thank you um, but um, I'm aware that we're we're now coming to a close uh, and midday is is fastly creeping up and um, we're very pleased to provide that support and we're very pleased Irina that um, you, you were able to explain to a wider audience why we've taken up the issue of um, Council of Europe member states doing more to protect journalists in exile. Um, we, now, we do now need to close the session, um, but before we close the session, we're looking at the most important, well, arguably one of the most important parts of the session, which is taking action, what can be done. And we have to, we find ourselves often repeating the same messages as press freedom community, but we have to keep on repeating them. But we're very pleased now that there's a shift um, that we see within the uh, EU and the Council of, Europe, Council of Europe to see the standards that are on the table being implemented better. And one of those uh, tools is the Journalist Matter campaign, which William Horsley from the Association, Association of European Journalists is going to talk us through. Thank you very much, Tom, and hello, everybody. Uh, William Horsley, the uh, Association of European Journalists uh, is a network of uh, independent journalists uh, across Europe uh, who share belief in uh, press freedom. And I have to say this coalition of the willing of the uh, uh, journalist organizations and NGOs is a kind of miracle of cooperation with institutions like the Council of Europe. But as you've heard today, we keep our independence. Five minutes, I'll make uh, five quick points. Uh, first, the purpose of the campaign. What the hell is it about? Uh, you can sum it up in two words, I think. The Secretary General of the Council of Europe herself uh, said, wake up. Wake up uh, Europe to the fact that the democratic backsliding, which we see virtually across the whole continent, is closely linked to at the attacks on the press, uh, those who bring us uh, the, the truth, and we have to uh, defend them. Uh, so uh, the urgency of the uh, situation is illustrated by the way that Russia has used the campaign of lies and uh, poisonous rhetoric uh, to, to prepare his country for uh, war crimes, uh, invasion, and mass destruction in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and the, Sec the Council of Europe was founded 75 years ago this year to prevent uh, the re repeat of the horrors of uh, war and the Holocaust. Um, the five-year campaign is uh, the result of the unique uh, genius of the Council of Europe in letting the civil society help to shape the rules and guidelines which uh, are guiding the campaign and the work that we do on the campaign uh, on, on, on the platform, 
Uh, this is a, a small version of the uh, Committee of Ministers recommendation of 2016, which actually uh, is a landmark in the creation of jurisprudence and gui guidance to states on the three areas of uh, protection against attack, uh, prevention, that's legal frameworks that work, and prosecutions uh, so to end uh, impunity. So, uh, secondly, the mechanics of uh, the campaign. How is it organized? Essentially, each member state is asked to create, to uh, appoint a so-called focal point, a coordinator. It's a massive job, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in danger of becoming a monstrous uh, mechanism, very difficult to uh, get to, uh, coherence out of the whole of Europe. So it will be a case of, in each country, uh, the uh, contact points, the, the focal points are asked to uh, be open-minded, fair-minded in dealing with all the stakeholders, that's of course the journalists and media, but also all the civil society voices, all the policy makers, the parliamentarians and so on, uh, identify priorities uh, and bring good uh, uh, results uh, over the uh, five years. Secondly, through uh, national committees or others that can create uh, uh, protection uh, mechanisms, uh, and about half of the member states uh, we estimate so far have got something to show in that direction. Some are really advanced, some are rudimentary, some don't exist. So thirdly, what about the substance? What uh, kind of results? Well, the annual report, of course, describes uh, some of the uh, key points which we've been hearing about today. Um, uh, the... the, the um, uh, the, the first full year of the campaign uh, is directed uh, primarily to the protection uh, leg of uh, the campaign. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the heart of that is what we call thorough uh, reforms of the police and uh, justice systems to counter assaults against journalists and the kind of abuses which we've been hearing about uh, from the previous presentations, uh, including uh, attacks on the, the press in uh, street uh, demos and uh, around, the, around uh, Europe, which we saw during COVID, but much more seriously, the, uh, the attacks and killings which we've seen even in the heart of Europe uh, with um, the uh, Georgios Karaivas uh, here in Greece, uh, Peter de Vries in the Netherlands, uh, Jan Kuciak and his uh, fiance in Slovakia, and of course Daphne Caruana Galicia. This shows the, the extent of the, of the rot inside uh, Europe. One of the, perhaps the model of the campaign, uh, uh, of that mechanism for many countries uh, is the Pers uh, organization in the Netherlands, which uh, it, it grew out of the press safety protection mandate, uh, where, where, which gives the, the police is, has a mandate to respond immediately to targeted attacks against journalists. Prosecutors give high priority to those cases, and their aggravated penalties can apply to those offenses. That's the kind of thing that can be done in uh, all, all countries. So, um, in particular, the misuse of defamation law, uh, uh, nearly 30 uh, countries uh, in Europe still have criminal defamation on their books. They could act to remove that uh, immediately. Uh, and then uh, non-legal uh, uh, methods uh, such as uh, against slaps, uh, to the early dismissal mechanism and so on. That is uh, something, for example, in the UK, there's an anti-slaps task force, which, which the government is working closely with uh, uh, the, the media, and that is working well. Fourthly, the political uh, leaders need to show uh, leadership uh, in this. Uh, the public, uh, too often public figures use their authority to uh, vilify uh, journalists, paint them as an enemy of the, the public, and that has to change, that's unacceptable in Europe. And fifthly, uh, how this should, we hope, boost the work of the platform itself. It's now a magnificent database for, uh, uh, for all to, to know the real situation of the uh, attacks on the, the press in, in Europe. Uh, we have friends, the group of friends within the Council of Europe we have high expectations of them. And some countries have shown some uh, reluctance or some willingness to remove themselves or to distance from the European Convention. We, I think, believe that the, it, they're not perfect. We need the European Convention. and We don't want to go to a, a situation 
uh, 75 years ago when, for example, uh, national intelligence services were completely secret, we didn't even know they existed, and then the abuses that we've seen in surveillance, anti-terrorism laws, and so on. The convention system and the work, cooperative work, is, is a defense against that. And the final point is we don't want flower arrangement. We want countries to come up with priority areas and to deliver whether it's in laws or protection uh, mechanisms, uh, and to raise the public awareness so that journalists are actually needed to tell the truth. Thank you. Thank you, William. And what a great point to uh, terminate your presentation on. But we do have one question. I thank you for your patience. We're now going to be overrunning uh, a little bit on the session. But we have a question from journalist Olatz Arieta. Um, Olatz, um, Hi. Olatz, you should have the floor now. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the floor. Uh, Olatz Arrieta from Basque Public uh, Television. Uh, on your report for a second year, uh, year in a row, uh, there is one journalist uh, that is jailed in the European Union. He's the only one. Uh, his journalist, uh, Pablo Gonzalez, who is jailed in Poland. Um, which are your concerns uh, about his situation, and are you expecting any changes uh, after the change of government in uh, in Poland? Thank you. Uh, who, fr who from the platform would like to answer? Uh, Oliver, would you like to? Ricardo, would you like to jump in here? Okay. Uh, as you know, it's a case we reported to the, to the platform, so we are still following the case. Uh, it's two years now long, uh, the detention, without uh, access for uh, Pablo Gonzalez to a fair trial. Uh, so we, we, we support the call from uh, journalist unions and uh, associations in Spain you know, to, to, the, um, to the Polish authorities. Uh, it's high time to uh, organize a trial, to, to give him the right uh, to a fair trial. And if there is no uh, proof, no evidence uh, to, to keep him in, in detention, it's high time to release it. So we really believe that, that now uh, it's, it's not a normal situation and we will increase, uh, I would say, the calls and um, the pressure on the new Polish government. So maybe the new uh, political uh, framework will change the situation. But uh, that's indeed one of the cases we are uh, still uh, following closely. Thank you. Um, well, look, we are going to now conclude the session. Um, again, I, we really hope that the annual report uh, shows the sort of solidarity and coordination that we as press freedom community have despite these enormous threats that journalists are now facing. Um, we have seen over the last several years real engagement from the Council of Europe um, in terms of the, the engagement with us as a platform, including from the Secretary General, the Committee of Ministers. We want to continue that engagement. It's very important. But um, as I mentioned before, we now have um, legislation from the European Union. We have the standards of the Council of Europe, which are there on the table. It really is now down to implementation. And we get down to very tricky questions about how this is going to be implemented at national level. As William has said, we hope that this can um, be channeled through the Journalist Matter campaign. Um, but uh, we also uh, hope that there's increased political will on some of these uh, subject areas that we've highlighted today, including surveillance, a moratorium on the export, sale, transfer and use of intrusive spyware, which Ricardo mentioned. There can't be the unlawful use of spyware against journalists. It needs to be investigated where there are allegations. We need legal safeguards in place. But in particular, uh, we need to see remedy. We heard from the journalists today. We need to hear that journalists feel that they're safe to do their work. Um, the, the, the war in Ukraine has also highlighted now that Council of Europe member states need to really address this question of journalists in exile. We are seeing very positive measures from some member states, but this also has to be extended to all journalists, um, that there are emergency short-term 
emergency visas, short-term visas, work visas, and that we think about how we can support them in their work um, in Excel. And that also includes awareness raising campaigns. Um, thank you for attending. I'd like to thank the panelists. I'd like to thank the journalists. Do take the report, read it, use it as a reference. Do engage with the platform. Um, help us promote the platform and a response of the alerts as a way of trying to pressure Council of Europe member states to take action and do more in the struggle for press freedom. Um, and thank you again to the Journalist Union of Math Macedonia Thrace. Um, and uh, I will now conclude the session and um, I can wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you.